Hello everyone, welcome back to my lesson videos. So today I will be doing some travel sketching. So we are traveling to Gibraltar. This is the rock of Gibraltar and we're going to draw this little lighthouse on the cliff. So let's get started. So before I do this, I normally try to have a little bit of warm-up and the warm-up includes what are the pens and pencils that I'm going to use. So if you're going to use a pencil or you're going to use a food air pen like this, what I normally do is just to warm my hands up, I will try to have a bit of warm up sketching. So, this is just to work out what my tools can actually do. If you've ever used food pens before, the ideal Fude pen technique would be to be able to do really thick lines like these as well as thin lines when you move the tip slightly forward like this you should be able to get a very very different quality of line and you should be able to get that line a little thinner too Right, so the quality of these three lines would be very, very useful when we're doing a landscape based on contour. So I call this contour lines. So three different lines with this Fude pen, Fude nip pen or it's also called bent nip so that's what this can do I'm going to use a pencil I'm also going to try and get the same kind of lines can I do it fast and then can I do it really really light so I will do straight lines first, and then after words, I'm gonna attempt to do curved lines. So this is called what I call an active line, where you start with a very smooth, deep line, and then you just pull it across. Smooth, deep line, pull it across. So you get this really nice, sharp ends of your pencil. So that's what I call the active lines. And this can be straight, where you can do very thin and then you press it down. This is another way of doing active lines. Quality of lines are very important to me when I'm doing any kind of drawing. But you also want to be able to control all your materials and get different kinds of texturing with it so once i've done that what else can i do with this line besides doing that i can also do a thick and thin perhaps so this is where you vary the variable of your pressures gets you different kinds of thick and thin quite nice wobbly lines so this will be very useful you want to make the C and there's just sort of variable thick and thin lines on it so I recommend using a regular pencil so that eventually the sharp ends gets duller and duller as opposed to using a mechanical pencil where it stays sharp sometimes that's not a benefit for 
certain kinds of sketching. So that's the other way I'm warming up at the same time. And then there's also a using of the uh, art artist grip, which is what this is, as opposed to holding like a pen like this. The artist grip is when you're holding it like the whole thing is a pencil. So you're using the side of the pencil to do a lot of this shading. It's very useful also when you want to press down or not so you can go as light and as hard as you want with this and you can cover let's say this is the the C and you want to cover some of them with some shades you can do this really really quickly it helps you to probably turn the page left uh, on an angle like this to do things like this because it, this is the most natural angle for your hands if you're right-handed Right? Obviously, if you're left-handed, turn it the other way. So that's a way to do it. Well, you can do it thin and you can do it very, a bit more thicker there. So there are other lines you can make to, to do the final warm-up, which is instead of making a line from the left to the right, like you are writing this way, you can also start from the other end of the pencil here Hold the pencil slightly further back so you have less control. This is super controlled. This is kind of lighter control. And see if you can make confident long lines with it. It may look very similar to those lines, but notice here that I'm getting straighter. I'm trying to get my line as straight and long as possible. So, the idea with this sort of exercise is for you to allow different mobility of your hands to do the work. So, if you want to do very big and very long lines, you should be able to do that without lifting your pencil away completely from the paper. You see how this is what is called, what I can call one continuous line or just continuous line. You could break the line and start again, but the idea is to be able to, for example, if I'm going to draw this pen, I should be able to draw it with one continuous line without lifting it. And pretty much get what I need to get. Even if you have to go over the same line again twice, that is one continuous line as opposed to trying to get the perfect angle or the perfect kind of... So I recommend that kind of way of drawing as opposed to this kind of way of drawing if you're the kind of person who does this. Why? It comes down to confidence, right? This is not a very confident kind of sketching behavior where I would recommend that you don't do this all the time. You obviously can do this sometimes, but the recommendation is for you to be completely comfortable with making whatever mistakes you're going to make, whatever kind of lines you're going to make, to make them with confidence. So, now let's quickly analyze the photo before we start. So what I do here, uh, I tend to try to have a little plan before I go ahead. So there is a horizon line about half or slightly less than half from the top of 
the composition that will be your horizon line and then there will be oops the lighthouse which is about two-thirds of the page on the side and then there'll be this huge rock about half of the page on this side um, yeah and we can even do that little tanker boat on the back but other than that that's all you kind of need to know in advance right so what I'm going to attempt with this is to get as many different textures as possible that we did before in the warm-up into here. Rocks have lots of different texture, so we need some textures and some marks here. The sea has textures, so we're going to try and put textures there. The sky has textures for the clouds. And then the uh, structure itself is the only thing that's probably least necessary for textures. So, so let me put this away. And if you like, you can do a border around the page that you want to do. Otherwise, you can also just freehand it and just decide where your horizon line is going to be. And then where half of your page is and that's where the rock will start slightly below the horizon line here would be where your rock would be so sketching the structural thing you only just need the basic structure all right so this is the end of the paper this is the rock top you don't need to start doing all the details on the rock already, but just notice there's a top bit and then there's rocky bits and some of these rocky bits are kind of up side, are kind of uh, up and down like this. Some of them forms little lines going across. That's pretty much all you need. And then if that's halfway to the front, further in like this, so the relationships between something and something else is important. So if that's the rock, that's the horizon line, where in here lies my lighthouse and to what degree of height does it have? Notice I am not trying to build this detailed lighthouse just yet. I'm just putting it where it is. So at this stage, you can also notice actually there is quite a bit of huge mountain at the back that kind of looks a bit like that. And then the sea has kind of lots of horizontal line going this way so I just want you to notice that and just draw a couple of lines and that's all you need that there is a tanker boat here so you can just place it there and then now once you've gone this far you can move on to your pen or as I like to say you can do whatever you like whichever way you like. So with the pen, um, I'd like to find the outlines of what is important. What is the, what I, what I mean by that is if you look at this, there is visible that these areas here are dark. Visible that some parts of this is in the dark, right? So there's shadows casting on here. There's shadows here, there are shadows here. So that's the next thing, next most important thing is to know where it will be dark and where it would be light. So having seen those, I'm now just going to use my blue pen to mark out roughly where these dark spots are. Lots of the bits 
underneath the rock would be somewhat dark and I am just going to mark them in this fashion. There's also vertical shadows that are going here. So the point of this exercise like this is for you to train your eyes to see shadows right away and not to see details right away. So once I'm here, I'm now going to just do a very quick outline of this lighthouse. So I will use the thinner point of my pen and I'm not going to go too too much detail there is a lot of detail happening here which i am not doing i'm just going to do the structural parts and that is it so it is a cylinder so we want to just suggest that it's a cylinder and for it to be slightly concave and convex on that line. And then you can actually draw a thin line across here as well to mark where that lands. So, yeah, let's do a bit more here. That's kind of all I'm doing. Now, what I'm going to do is try to create some shading with this pen. So I'm going to decide to do a sideway hash lines like this. Not yet doing what is called a cross hatching necessarily, but I'm doing just one line across the darkest part of the rocks. So, this is just a different style that uses a lot of contour lines. So this is what I, I guess we can call this the contour line landscape. And then if you like, you can also do some lines going across the top of the surface here. So I'm using, a set, again, a thin line thin thin line going across feathery at the end so it's pretty clear what that is and then now I started noticing oh okay there's some other little random shapes in the middle here that are actually darker than the rest of the rocks and some of them are quite small and clumped together recommend you continue to look at your reference to see what it is that I'm doing because I am noticing a lot of the dark spaces on the rock area I haven't touched anything else so that's basically I'm going to stop there with the pen for now because what I want to have is a very nice soft horizon line between the sky and the and the sea. 
Now I'm going to move this slightly to the left so you can see. My palette. So now that I've done this, if there is any lines in here that I don't want, like my helping lines here, and maybe loosening up some of the marks here, you know, that's kind of enough. So wet your brush and I'm going to just use whatever is in my palette. Sometimes this is called muddy palette, so whatever is dirty in here I will use, but if you don't want to do this, please, you can just clean your palette before you start. I always want to start with the lightest color sky so you can use ultramarine blue and wet it down to a consistency of a tea and mix a nice um, a nice mix of it in your palette before you start now, if you want to have a very nice sky, a very clean kind of sky, this is what I recommend to do. To just with my brush, I wet the horizon line. And actually, I'll just paint across the structure, across the, um, the building, because it's okay to do. So, there's a little bit of blue in this water, and then I'm gonna mix in now that blue with it. So, what you initially will get is this wet on wet, soft kind of line, right? And then over that, we're just going to bring this up to roughly where the end of the mountain at the back. So notice how thin this, this mix is. Now give yourself a few minutes. In the meantime, with the same mix, what I'm going to do is reload it. And now I'm going to create texture with my brush. So I do thin and thick and thin again, carrying on over here the same way. That would be my first sky and cloud. And now I'm going to do thick. I started, just press down your brush down and pull it across and go thin and create another line near it and here I press down and pull and push you see what I get there it is this beautiful layered looking sky so this employs a brush skill that I think you can practice with. So I'm gonna carry on with that same thing where if I start with thick, I'll go thin in the middle and then I'll try to go thick again before I end at the other side. And I'll continue this variating, doing different variation of thick and thin until I reach the top and leaving this beautiful, really little thin white lines sometimes across. And then you can stop there. So you created this differences between the sky and the mountain in the back. I'm gonna do a few more here. And see 
when your paper isn't the greatest, it starts to, to do sort of pooling, that's okay. Now that's done, what you can do is mix a little bit of ultramarine blue to try to get the C. Now, this is where it will start to get really interesting. So my ultramarine blue has some green in it. So it's a warmer kind of blue. I'll do a nice mix here. And once you do this, what you want to do is employ a different brush strokes. So I've employed, I've loaded my brush with, with that color. And what I want to do is use a tissue and I want to just blot it slightly before I start. So it's a little bit, now it's a little bit drier. And I want you to just pull that across and come with this slightly drying kind of brush strokes. Right, so you get to know your brush a lot more when you do this. So I don't, I try not to put too much paint in my, in my brush. So it, it's very dry now, that almost nothing is coming out, but check it out. You don't want to be too fast going back into the paint because some of the shadows that you're creating with your dry brush is actually very nice. So now that it's completely dry, I'll load it up again and try to do the same thing. Try to blot it before you start and go in that direction. Right, so underneath the rocks, it will be quite dark and it will be kind of greener if you look at the texture, if you look at the, the reference. So what I'm going to do here is add more water to my blue and just introduce a little bit of green in there. And then I'm going to go full wetness from the bottom of the rocks out. just up to there. And then as you go up towards the front, I want you to just lift your brush a bit and go vertical. Go diagonal with it. So the mix needs to be quite thin, I guess, a bit like tea. So with the tea consistency, you can still see that dry brush underneath it that you did before. So this is the, the next step. Once that's done, I'm going to clean my brush and I'm going to go into deciding what the texture here is going to be. So the color of the rocks are kind of yellowish, yellow ochre brown. I'm going to now change my brush to one that is a little more uh, stiffer. brush. It's still a, a very loading brush, a very kind of a mop brush. And now I'm going to move up a little bit and mix a nice ochre mix. So water, ochre, and we want this consistency to be a bit thicker than, than, than tea, so it's like something like a coffee. And I want you to think about what the texture is going to be at the top. So if I started up here, just putting it out on just a wash over the top like this, that's fine. But once I, I decided to go lower, I'm going to change tactics. So here I'm going to create some texture that are like this. Pretty much the same movement as I did with the pen before. But because this brush is very smooth and very loaded with water, it created this quite thick kind of lines. 
And then across this whole area here, you will see that there's different kinds of texture. You don't have to be very, very uh, precise, but I would say this is the kind of texture that I see. They're kind of blotty and inconsistent, but there's sort of dots like this. All right, and so this is the first grouping of dots to start with. So because these are rocks, make sure that they are not equal or similar to each other. Make sure they're all a bit different. And then make sure that you can't really see your brush tips so perfectly. So for example, if I keep doing this kind of lines, then it looks more like bricks. That is not what we are doing. So we want to break that up and make that kind of abstract dots. Same thing with this. So you can just paint little dots over all your initial lines. So I'm going to repeat that pretty much everywhere. And as I do this, I'm running out of paint. My paint gets less and less, right? So I'm going to take advantage of that and start going a bit thicker and longer. So I'm putting down my brush in this way. You see how that's a bit too regimented, a bit too much similar. So I'm going to try and break that up a bit without losing the texture that I'm creating. So I sometimes go this way, I sometimes go this way, and then I sometimes want to go the opposite way. This way. Again, trying not to be so uniform. So because I'm losing paint, the rocks get lighter anyway. Right, and then here there'll be some dark, dark blotches. So what I do is I'm gonna try and maximize the use of my paint. So if there's still a lot of paint in my brush, I will just continue. And now, down here, I'm going to be a bit more generous. And I'm trying to go in different angles, I'm trying to create my texture with whatever is left in my brush. So I will start dark, and small, and then I started varia variations of this plotches, I suppose you can call it. And this is the first initial texture that you want to create. So as you go towards the end of the paint, you can be more crazy, you can just blot it everywhere you go. So there's a if you look at the, the surface of these rocks right now, there is at least five different variations of brush bends and brush lines and texture that is already happening. Right, my brush is now quite dry, but you see that even if I continue with it, there's still some texture I can make with it. Even when the brush is like this, this is the best. So, what I would do now is use the other brush and just leave this. This is really good for texturing. So I'm gonna use the other brush to get some water. And I'm now gonna introduce another value, another darker color into my rocks. Whoops. So I'm adding a darker burnt umber into here into the mix. And now what I'm gonna do with this, I'm gonna leave this brush and I just take a little bit of paint from here into this dry brush. But keep that shape, right? So I'm gonna pick up some dark paint, but leave some of that alone. And then what you wanna do now is find the darkest part of the rocks, which I've already put down here, and try to add more textured kind of rocks there. So if you think that the paint is not dark enough, I recommend just going straight into the palette. So what I do is, 
with this dry brush, I go straight inside here without adding any water to it. And then I'm going directly on the paper. So you notice that this is quite quite wet. So sometimes you take away some of that wetness. So I'm concentrating only in areas that has dark patches now. So this whole area here is actually quite dark. So I'm going to go back into the dark brown and I'm going to introduce some blue all directly from the pan. So this area here is now a mix of blue and brown. But I'm using the same method of touching down with it. So that's there. And I really like that. So I'm gonna try and introduce some more dark of that, some of the same darkness of that into here. Going back into my blue dry brush, going back into my brown dry brush, and carry on. So I'm also going slightly into the water because that water area is actually dark, so I don't think that's a problem. You can clean that up later. This is actually fun, quite a good way to do it. So as you do this, don't just stay here because the rocks are kind of, they morph into each other, they turn into each other. So you want to have a continuation when you change color throughout the rocks. And as I do this, notice my brush is getting drier and drier, but notice also how beautiful the texture is. So you are slowly now moving away from really, really clean kind of um, lines to all different kinds of texture. Yep. So stop here for a minute and analyze. Do I need to keep going? Do I stop? Sometimes it's good to stop early. We can always add more texture to that, and we will, we will. So I'm going back to my brush, my usual brush now, and I'm going to paint in the red. Just here. So I have a very bright red. There's no problem with that. And then I'm going to add a gray. So the mix of gray, a neutral gray is a bit of ultramarine blue. Let me just clip this down. A bit of ultramarine blue, a bit of burnt umber. Okay, a nice neutral gray. So a bit of gray. And I'm going to just do the right side of this tower. Up there, I would go into, into the red, but not just yet because that is still too wet. As you can see, so I'll leave that alone for now. Um, and then with that same gray, I'm going to try and add shadows, values already in the rocks as well. Right, so now this area that I've used my pen on, I can accentuate them with the grey. So this is a very light medium grey, which is nice to use. And then 
I will carry on to the bottom to the C here, which is all dark anyway. I move forward a bit into this diagonal lines that I did before. So, ooh, what's that? So sometimes you have mistakes or blotches and stuff. That's okay. That is currently the state of it. So the only thing I'm going to do next is to try and get the C here to be darker. So I'm going to mix this more intense color and I'm going to just paint that on the top where the C is. So you can do this slightly thicker, but you can also keep it juicy so that the texture underneath can still be seen. bottom part here a little less painted and the top part only painted and then what I'm going to do is go back to I kind of want to go a little bit darker blue for the mountain area there so I'm going to add grayish blue in that so I use a bit of indigo and a bit of burnt umber so I get a slightly darker gray but you want to be more cool forward or blue forward with that. And always thrive for imperfection because Really, that is kind of the nicest thing about watercolor, is to keep it imperfect, right? And even on this, in the back here, when it's a little bit blotchy, it's actually great because that is also the texture of mountains. That's it for it for now, guys. When everything is dried, we're gonna go one more round of dark shadowing. We'll get that in a minute. Okay, so at this stage, I'm going to do a final touch up and also to add the so-called final shadow final finishing touches and what I usually do here is just using whatever is in my palette to create a gray. It's a mix of all the things that are already in my palette and in case it's just kind of a bit red, reddish, in order to make that more beautiful neutral gray I add blue to that oh now I've just done it too much so I've kind of want to go back and forth between brown and blue to try to get my shadow color so at this stage you can mix quite a generous amount of it so that you don't run out halfway and go, wow, then you don't want to have to mix another another gray because you are not going to get it. So this is now a beautiful sort of bluish greenish gray that I've got. So looking at the reference, my the top of my lighthouse is a little bit cockeyed. It's slightly kind of, it's not centered. So sometimes I will try and fix that by adding shadows in a slightly 
different way than normal. So what I sometimes do here is I just add the shadow in the center of the top of my my lighthouse. You see how I just left that bit a little bit empty because I wanted to direct your eyes towards the dark and without changing the shape because I can't because it's all done by pen just by shifting slightly the shadow I give the illusion that I have actually fixed it even though I haven't so that's a good trick if you want to give it a try in case something like this happens so looking at the reference again I'm just going to go through over some of the shadows that I've already created previously. So some of the shadow I created was using a pen, a blue pen. So sometimes my shadow over that would just be enough, just like this. Or sometimes you might wanna have, just give it a little bit more darkness so you can add a bit more pigment to that. So what I'm doing here is just blobbing quite dark shadows on the areas just under the rock here. So in a way to try and cover the space where the blue line is and also to create just extra dark, beautiful dark texture on the cliffside. And also here, I'm just adding a little bit of... So, this is why I like my shadow to be one consistent color, because then I can add shadows to the rocks as well as to the sea, just underneath the rocks. So the, the inner rock in here will be just so much more darker anyway and you can go you can unify all the shadows if you just use the same one all across the bottom into the C part so this is what I am doing now so a lot of this part of the coast is quite dark and using the same shadow I can create that So I go back and forth between the bottom shadow and the top shadowing of the rocks. And it's kind of good to do a variation of, of dots. So I sometimes just do dots and sometimes I do lines. So certain parts of these rock gradually becomes lighter. So you don't want to just stop there because then it becomes a little stiff. So some of this I'm just adding a little bit more grey and add a variety of different brush strokes. Some of it is a stroke, some of it is a, a dot. So I am just dropping basically lots of different shapes of paint which is the tip of my brush. So constantly now I am looking at the reference a bit more, trying to really, really put all the dark areas in there. So in this case, sometimes you can do a variation of a little bit more green, a little bit more brown, right on the painting. You don't have to mix it all there necessarily. You can just dot it around uh, or have your dots have a variety of, of, of color, of pigments and of consistency. So remember, this is rocks. 
so the more uneven they are the better they look and finally if you want to you can put there is actually there was a tanker here so I'm just gonna see if I can add that in there it's quite a blue a dark color just using very dark blue and just doing the bottom of the tanker a little bit here and I will talk about about finishing the top part of the tanker after this. So once I've finished with this, uh, what else am I doing? Oh yes, I'm gonna add a little more the window. The window can be dark there and there. Yeah, there's a door there. Yes. Okay. Let's just finish this with a little bit of pen. So I'm using a micron just to add a little bit of definition for the top of the tanker. Just to show that that has a top. And I think that is all. That's it. Hope you enjoyed that and thanks for watching. See you next time.